Good afternoon. My name is Sonora Monks, ESA's Director of Programs and Education. Thank you for attending today's webinar titled Hazard Analysis Within Energy Storage Systems. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at www.energystorage.org. Participant lines will be muted throughout the webinar. However, we welcome your questions and comments, which can be submitted at any time via the chat box on the left side of your screen. Following the webinar, you will receive a link to the recording and slides, as well as a brief survey regarding today's topic and topics for future webinars. Your feedback will ensure that ESA continues to provide the highest value information to you and your company. Today, we will hear from our speaker, Robert Steele, who is Project Manager and Systems Engineer uh, at Intertech. And uh, we'll also get a brief introduction from Brad Offelt, who is the National Sales Operations Lead at Intertech. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Brad, who will begin today's presentation. Brad? Yes, thank you, Sonora, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, again, as Sonora mentioned, my name is Brad Affeld. I'm the National Sales Operations Lead for Intertech's energy business in the U.S. As we begin our session and prepare to get into the technical details of our subject matter, I'd just like to take a, a brief moment to go over what we are going to be discussing today. Uh, first off, if I can get the... There we go. Uh, we're going to talk... Just the basics, what is an arc flash assessment and why do we have to invest in the expenses to undertake that. Uh, we're going to do a brief uh, video, a rather violent video, of a demonstration of what an arc flash is. We're going to cover DC arc flash for energy storage systems specifically, and then we'll spend some time to go over uh, question and answers. Uh, just very briefly, Intertech's roots can be traced all the way back to Thomas Edison, uh, particularly through our ETL mark. Edison began ETL in the 1890s as a place to perform performance testing on many of his inventions and products. Since it was acquired in the late 1980s, the NERDL division of Intertech and its ETL mark have become a major provider of product performance and safety testing. In addition to certification, Intertech provides all kinds of assurance and risk mitigation services to support our customers' needs. Intertech has evaluated and certified 700 different product lines of power conversion and large format battery equipment from over 200 different manufacturers and many more field installations on top of that. Intertech is one of the companies that makes up the testing, inspection, and certification industry and is the second largest in that industry by market capitalization. We make up about 42,000 employees, 1,000 sites, 18 different global businesses, and in 100 countries. So in this industry, oh sorry, apologize. In this industry, we're constantly perfecting our services to meet changing customer demands. Total quality assurance is assuring that we assist our customers in identifying risk in all areas of the product life cycle, from ideation to end of life, as well as in many other areas of the business. It also obviously applies directly in this webinar too, ergo the DCR flash discussion. As energy storage system manufacturers or integrators or EPCs or wherever you are in the value chain. Uh, you need to rely on certain things happening during the course of a project. You need to meet your customer specs, systems have to be commissioned on time, and equipment must perform over its life. Happy customers come back for future projects, and we aim to make it easier to ensure that that happens. So again, our subject matter today centers around the risks and requirements associated with arc flash hazards in large battery energy storage systems, and what stakeholders should be aware of when developing an energy storage project. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our subject matter expert, Dr. Robert Steele. Robert, are you muted? Can you hear Hi, me now? Robert. Hello. Hi. I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. So I just didn't know what the problem was there. It was unmuted the entire time. Yeah. Okay, well, so, sorry about the technical difficulties there, everybody. Again, my name is Robert Steele. Um, I've been a principal investigator doing arc flash hazard analysis since the early 90s. And with the advent of new innovative energy storage systems in, D in the DC arena, it's creating problems for an industry that has yet to even get their, their hands around what, um, what does it really mean for a DC system and how do they perform when it comes to arc flash. And so what I'm going to do is start off with basically go high level, uh, talk about 
why we need to invest the time and money and resources to do our price hazard analysis. Then I'll get into showing a little bit vignette, like Brad said, on um, what an arc flash really looks like. Uh, although it's not a DC arc flash, but it does demonstrate how violent an electrical explosion is and how, why, we, why we need to be concerned about that. And um, then we're going to get into talking specifically about what, in, what is involved in DC arc flash. And I'm going to walk through NFPA 70E as the nine-step process, trying to illustrate what's different between a DC arc flash and then what's, what's important we need to consider moving forward. So with that, probably the biggest question I have from everybody who's, who's doing arc flash is, why do I get to spend the time and money and do this? Well, in order to understand that first, we have to understand what is an arc flash. And an arc flash is effectively an electrical explosion that results in high kinetic energy, molten materials, uh, superheat, uh, acu acoustic uh, concussion, wa concussion waves that can result in serious injury for people. And as you can see up there, I'm not going to read the bullets to you, but there are thousands of incidents that are still happening within our country every year. And although the trend is moving downward, uh, through become, engineers becoming more familiar with arc flash and our PPE, our personal protective equipment becoming more prevalent. Uh, we're now learning as an industry how to match this up. But what causes arc flash? Primarily, um, our, our electrical infrastructure is getting older and the, the cost of maintaining those is becoming more and more problematic. And so employers are often delaying uh, their maintenance practices. And so you get conditions like the accumulation of dust. I was recently in a uh, cardboard manufacturing facility where they hadn't touched their electrical switch gear in probably about 10 years. And it was amazing the amount of dust that was sitting on top of the, of the, the, the contacts of the breakers. Those themselves can cause, uh, over time, a flashover resulting in an arc flash incident. And if a person standing not nearby there or inside the panel, they could be uh, exposed to severe uh, heat and flying materials. Interestingly enough, though, is that 75% of all arc flash incidents happen because of human error. Now, this is primarily at the point where it's in, 70, in NFPA 70E, it's called the safe to work check. And that's when the qualified journeyman electrician is inside a cubicle or a bucket or switch gear getting ready to do their safe to work check to make sure there's no voltage there because we don't want our, our guys working on energized gear unless there's compens compensatory measures. And as, although we do the best we possibly can, 75% um, of the time we bump into things or tools get dropped and bad things happen and we end up having a significant arc flash incident. Also contributing to this is environmental conditions, the condensation and humidity. I was recently in, down in Mexico looking at some switch gear, and the corrosion from the humidity down there to me was mind-boggling. The, the switch gear wasn't that old, but already had uh, significant um, corrosion inside and outside the, the, the switch gear. And that in itself, because of uh, if a switch gear is required to operate to interrupt an event, that in itself, because of slow operation, could cause a problem. And lastly, is an interesting statistic that 73% of all arc flash incidents happen in organizations with good or average electrical safety practices. So maintenance and our people doing work really is the largest initiator for um, what can happen to start an arc flash event. But with, now we understand what the, the causes or what can initiate it, let's look at the ramifications of doing that. I do apologize if, if people in the audience already know all this stuff. Um, I'm trying to do a high level before I work my way down into getting into the calculations of how to do an arc flash for DC systems. And most first and foremost is the burns. As you'll see in the video here in a minute, um, there is on the average of 7,000 burn injuries per year, ranging between first and fourth degree burns. Of those, about 28% of those end up going to burn centers uh, require hospitalization, and over 400 have died uh, since 2007 as a result of arc flash incidences. 
and that it could be uh, end up being about one to two deaths per day due to arc flash. And something this is completely preventable um, by engineers doing their job and understanding the consequences of which when we send our general electrician to go do work, we have to characterize the hazards that they're going to be facing, specifically in DC systems, because DC systems behave completely differently than AC systems. There's also a result of this is high energy fires. And as the, the electrical equipment evaporates, there's molten metals being tossed with significant kinetic energy able to pierce the human body. In the electrical explosion, there's also a pressure blast wave in terms of thousands of square feet uh, that can end up collapsing lungs or rupturing eardrums. And the noise, the acoustic part of this is that uh, it's like a loud, high, high, high caliber, high round uh, rifle shot. Uh, that could cause you to lose your hearing. And lastly is the heat from the arc itself. And arc flashes range can get greater than 35,000 degrees, which is four times hotter than the sun. And for people who are standing in the proximity of an arc blast, up to 10 feet away, they can receive severe burns. And even 20 feet away, they can be impacted by, by the flying debris. So let's look, at, let's look at the consequences of that. Now let's look at the costs associated with what happens with arc flash. There's the medical costs. Now these are the costs for both the employer and the employee. And of course, some of the soft costs we can't really, we can't quantify, but those we do quantify, we've got here in some statistics. On average, a burn treatment takes 1.5 days of hospitalization per percentage of body burned. Um, I think that's self-explanatory. Um, the average hospital stay is about $18,000 per day. And statistically, um, we're looking at about 19 days per arc flash incident. So the hospitalization can run up anywhere between $350,000 upward from there. <clears throat> Most arc flash injuries end up costing the company, just for medical leave alone, about a million and a half dollars. So there's significant financial um, costs and liability associated with doing or not doing arc flash. So let's look at the, comp the compensatory costs. Um, it takes every employee, on average, between eight and 12 months to be able to return back to work. And in 2014, although it's a little, a little bit uh, dated, the average in injured employee claimed about $57,000 in workers' comp. So we have the medical costs and we have the workers' comp, and we haven't looked at the legal costs yet. And you can see they're underlined the average cost for a single arc flash incident costs between 10 and $15 million to the employer uh, just in dealing with the incident. We haven't even begun to address the lost production costs yet. So lost production costs, the statistics from the industry are showing that 57.5% of low voltage and flash injury patients attempt to work, attempt to return work within three months. 107 days. And you know, being a workaholic myself, I don't think I could be idle for that kind of time, so I understand the propensity of trying to get back to work. So a third of those have successfully turned back in about two months. And most injuries of the employees end up having to take time off. So there's huge lost production costs. Now, a moment ago, I talked about the soft costs. If you're familiar with or know anybody who has been injured due to arc flash or due to a shock, um, as a teammate, you, your, 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 your production is, is impacted as well because you're just not, you don't know if it's going to happen to you or not. So there's a soft cost associated with this as well. So we haven't ta yet talked about the, the normative requirements and the legal costs associated with that. And so the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, um, has guidelines that we, ha that we have to follow legally. And you can see there that on the presentation that the average Arc flash incident costs about $12,600 per violation per day. And depending upon the significance of it, it can result in, you know, hundreds and thousands, million dollars worth of, of fines, but also can include jail time, especially if there's re re repeat convictions. So what I want to do now is talk about what are the normative requirements. So you see the list here of a couple uh, OSHA requirements that have to be satisfied. Get to the next slide here. So we have 10 CFR 1910-132-D1. Basically, it says 
employers got to understand the hazard environment which we're putting our employees in. Specifically, we have to put placarding out there to warn them in order to see what, what the hazard. So typically, when you walk up to a piece of switch gear, you'll see a shock hazard. Hopefully, you'll see a, a fire hazard. You may see a, a tripping hazard. You may see um, a, a pinch hazard, that sort of thing. Those are all driven by the OSHA requirements. Then, 332B1 basically says that the employers have to train the, their people to understand their job assignments. And, and going on to 333, we've got to pro make sure they're qualified, don't work hot, and 335, we've got to provide the right protective equipment. So these are the normative requirements that OSHA hands down when they come do arc flash uh, event investigations. And um, you'd be surprised at the number of organizations that say, eh, I don't have to meet OSHA standards. Uh, they don't apply to me. And uh, I had another paper mill that I did an arc flash event on. The, uh, the employers had tried to get out of that, but ultimately ended up getting slapped with some pretty significant fines for dereliction. So now that we <clears throat> kind of understand what what is an arc flash, what are the consequences of it, and what are the, what are the costs associated, ultimately OSHA says you got to do this. You got to do a risk assessment. You got to define the arc flash boundary of what you need to keep only qualified people in and unqualified people out. You need to characterize what is the incident energy, and we'll get into the incident energy here in the definition in just a moment. We have to characterize the proper hazard characterization for the equipment and give the people the right amount of PPE. And then understanding the risk, we have to try to figure out how to mitigate it. And that can be through training, through PPE, through uh, a myriad of different ways of, of troubleshooting and maintaining electrical equipment that we're not going to get into just yet. Um, but I will say that in the design and construction of um, battery storage units, um, I'll touch on this a little bit later, but arc flash doesn't simply mean that it's operational. It means you also have to characterize the hazard as the, the people are um, constructing this. We're currently working on a calculation that as they start building battery strings, at what point in time do these people need to start donning the different levels of PPE as they complete these strings? <clears throat> so there's typically four standards that we, we point to here in the U.S. We have NFPA 70E. Uh, we have the CSA standard for electrical, workplace electrical safety in Canada. If you're in Europe or in Australia, it's EN. 5110-1 uh, talks about how to operate in it. Specifically, they don't go into the level of detail that you have in 70E or the CSA, uh, but basically they say you have to do an arc flash risk assessment. All of the standards points to IEEE 1584 on a guide of how to perform uh, arc flash risk hazard calculations. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show um, an example of Although this is an AC um, arc flash hazard event, it, it illustrates the significance and importance why we need to do this. Here in this high power electrical testing facility, we're going to find out why arc flash and arc blast are so dangerous. Let's check out the final preparations. We're going to energize this power panel, similar to the type found in almost every industrial facility, to see what happens when we create an arc flash. But first, I'm out of here. We're ready to test. Three, two, one. A worker has no chance of getting out of the way. An arc flash can reach 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit causing disabling second and third degree burns in seconds. It creates a pressure wave called an arc blast that can reach thousands of pounds per square inch, enough to knock someone off a ladder, rupture an eardrum, or collapse a lung. It'll blow equipment apart and propel shrapnel with enough force to completely penetrate a worker's body. An unprotected worker could be severely injured or killed 
Okay, so hopefully everybody heard that video. What it basically did is it showed a mannequin standing in front of a 40 volt power panel. It looked like it had about a five or 600 ampere main breaker there, which they shorted and applied power to, and then it showed um, what the consequences are of the blast. And had an employee been standing there without the right proper PPE, uh, the clothes that they would have been wearing would either have been melted into their skin or on fire, and the mannequin got pushed away from, blown away from the, the environment there. That video, along with other videos that are available, are, I got that from YouTube, um, and we can provide the MP3 for you if you'd like, or you can just go out and just do arc flash um, videos on YouTube and show a whole lot of interesting videos that are out there. So what I've done so far is I've kind of highlighted what is an arc flash, why do we gotta do it, why do we need to invest the money, and for really a small investment, the cost avoidance is in terms of tens of millions of dollars for for the employer and also for the employee. Um, so that way we, we, want, we want all of our people to go home safely. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to transition from why into how. How do we characterize DC systems? Now, the rest of this discussion primarily focuses on the guidelines within NFPA 70E uh, and how we go about doing the arc flash studies. But... They also apply internationally. So the, the, although specifically we'll get into this minutia on the calculations, how to, but still it's, it, this is a, it's ubiquitous and so they can be applied anywhere. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into what are the requirements that are driven by NFP 70E? Article 130 basically says you gotta do either an inc incident energy analysis or use tables in order to define what the PPE level is. Now, I'm gonna show both of this throughout the next several slides, but ultimately, uh, Table 130C3715A basically says, you already know what the available short circuit, short circuit duty is, and therefore you can simply table it. And then once you have that information, that sends you to another table in which you pick your PPE. What the industry is doing specifically on DC is using more of an instant energy analysis, <clears throat> where you go do the math. Now, it's understanding, please understand that you can't use a combination of the two tables and do the, the incident energy analysis. The, the standards are very clear. Those are individual and separate. And I'll, I'll demonstrate what you do in order to use the, the right tables to go through the incident energy analysis. But before we get into that, we've got to establish some definitions that everybody will understand. So on your screen now are, are four definitions of what is incident energy. The incident energy basically is the, is the flash, the power that comes out from what we saw in that video as a result of an arc event. We calculate these in terms of, of calories per centimeter squared. Why do we do that? Because that's what we, how the, the PPE is characterized. So we want to make sure that the, we match the incident energy to be less than than the calories per centimeter squared on the PPE we're going to put our employees in. Arc flash boundary. The arc flash boundary is the, is the boundary condition outside of the area of influence that an exposed worker could, could see an arc at or below 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. What's the big deal about that? 1.2 calories per centimeter squared is the threshold for a second degree burn. So we're basically saying if you're outside of that, that area, you could receive a second degree burn if you're in the area of proximity or influence of the arc flash event. What is the ampere interrupt rating? That is the, it is the rating of the protective device that can safely interrupt uh, an overload or a short circuit condition. <clears throat> and then we have the short circuit current rating is defined as the highest available fault current in amps at the, on the feed side of the panel that will not result in unsafe matter on the load side. A big part of this in doing DC analysis is understanding the time current curves. What you have here on the right part of your screen is a log log scale of a 25 uh, ampere motor case circuit breaker. So we have what's in there and shaded in red is the time current curve that is the statistical envelope by which that breaker will operate as a function of current and time. 
The horizontal axis is the is the amount of current in app years, and the vertical axis is that in, in time. So, for an example, if you look at the screen, if you say if if this if this breaker in an AC uh, in an AC system saw 100 amperes with the short circuit duty, it would take approximately on the fast end about seven seconds to open, and on the long end about 30 seconds to open. So that's a statistical envelope by which how quickly a circuit breaker will will, will operate. And the manufacturers go through a series of IEEE C37 standards, and they test the heck out of these in order to, they test thousands of these in order to get this envelope. Keep this in mind because we're going to come back to this because this is very important into calculating the incident energy. So NFB 70E basically says there's nine steps in order to do an arc flash risk assessment. Uh, you need to collect the system data. You need to determine the system operating modes, and this is very important for DC because it, I'll get into that here in a second, but keep that in mind. You need to calculate the short circuit currents available and arcing currents, determine the protective device performance characteristics, which is why I showed the time current curve curve just a moment ago. You determine the amount of instant energy for the equipment that, that you're considering. And then, although this is a little, out of, a little bit out of uh, sequence, at this point, I typically start performing the or start the the risk assessment because you need to know what the internal energy is going to be before you can start looking at all the boundary conditions. Step seven: select appropriate PPE for the people, and then select the working distances, and then determine your arc flash boundary, which you keep everybody outside of. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through use this nine-step process to illustrate the nuances of a DC system. And I do apologize; I'm going to get a little techy and get into calculations. Um, but it's used to truly really to illustrate the significance of why we need to give DC systems um, all the due diligence it's it's due. Okay, so collecting system data, what does that mean? Um, whether you're collecting system data on an AC or DC system, it's pretty much the same approach. Effectively, you're trying to get your hands on the up-to-date signal line diagrams. Um, you need to get manufacturer touch sheets for protective devices, including the time current curves from manufacturers. If you're using fusing, as I'll show you here in a minute, you need to get the fuse curves. Um, if you're using fuse links uh, as part of the overall credit safety, you need to get that information from the manufacturer as well, even though it's not a fuse, it's still being relied upon for safety. <clears throat> It's important to know that when you're looking, if you want to do a worst case scenario, as what's typically done in AC systems, if you do this in a DC system where you say, I'm going to ignore the, the contribution of the cables and the length and stuff like that, that could result in an unacceptable uh, consequence for a longer uh, time constant, which I'll get here in a minute. So when you, in DC systems, it's really, really important. I can't stress this enough to get all of the impedance information documented so it can be calculated properly. <clears throat> and if you want to, if you've never done this before, uh, in the back of uh, IEEE 1584 are some great guidelines that you can use to help you do a system lockdown and start collecting all the data. So what I'm going to do is I want to pick on this example right here. I have a, I have a battery bank that's fed from an inverter, um, 40 volt on the primary side, and secondary side is about 1,000 volts DC. There's 10 strings with 12, 12 modules. So we'll go through and we'll, we want to collect all the information on that entire setup. So typically, when you look at the batteries, we need, to, we need to get down to information on the batteries itself. So we need to get the number of plates, the surface area of each plate, the separation, the conductivity of current carrying members, including the plates. Um, big part of this is getting the battery internal resistance. State of charge is a huge part of the calculation here. So depending upon how you're going through your operations, whether you're doing construction, uh, state of charge, which I'll show you here mathematically, is a big part of determining the overall incident energy. Of course, you've got to determine the number of cells and branch circuits and everything else. You also need to worry about what's going to be contributed from the AC side. Um, the people typically overlook the contribution through the inverter. Uh, unless it's a self-commutating inverter, they will be let through, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you need to know the, the primary side short circuit current contribution as well as the cable lengths because this all goes into the, the calculation for the, the uh, time constant for the DC system. <clears throat> the graphic I have shown here 
uh, was one I made just the other day for a client to illustrate that when you do a DC arc flash hazard analysis, it is a system level approach. Uh, I show a little uh, uh, lightning bolt there, um, which is which is switch gear number one, and the the available contribution there is not only from that from the battery, but it's also from the entire system coming into the battery. And in some cases, without the right uh, protective device, it could get up in, into dangerous levels. Okay, step two, determining your operating modes. Important thing to know here for DC systems is that the highest available fault current may not yield the worst case arc flash energy. Um, that is because in a DC system, unlike AC systems, you, in AC systems we have the sinusoid crosses the zero asymptote 120 times a second. Well, in a DC system, it never crosses zero. So even though there may be the highest fault current that's available in there, due to the, the system impedance itself, the rise time or time constant may be on the order of five, five times the time constant in order to interrupt that, the protective device. And the protective device, whether it be a fuse or breaker, may not realize that um, right away. So, again, I uh, want to emphasize you've got to characterize the, the scenarios of which you're going to be operating. Now, I talked earlier about a little bit of state of charge. <clears throat> I'll show you an equation here in just a moment that is pretty simple in the front, but if you're going to be working on equipment that has a lower state of charge, say like 25%, you'll see mathematically the instant energy is directly proportional to that. So if lower instant energy may cause the, your protective device, your fuse, your breaker, to operate slower, resulting in a larger incident of energy. Okay, step three, calculate the short circuit current available and arcing currents. DC systems are pretty straightforward, right? We learned this uh, for those that are electrical engineers. Uh, when you did your first level classes, you learned that Ohm's law. System current is a function of the, the system voltage divided by the system impedance. This is very true for DC systems. Um, I wanted to emphasize here, this is where I talked about the contribution to the overall short circuit duty available is through the AC side as well. And depending upon the type of inverter you have, um, the maximum current that a charger will deliver on a short circuit will not typically exceed 150% of the full, uh, full load after rating of, of the charger until the, th the thermistors blow. But ultimately for that time, if there's gonna be, uh, let's just say for sake of discussion that you have a 300 ampere uh, charge current on your, on your inverter, you end up seeing it's probably up to about 450 amps as an additional contribution that will play into the overall performance of the system. <clears throat> Inverters have a large have a large battery bank, a capacitor bank, and the impedance in there will cause the, the contribution to rise slower in the overall calculation of the system impedance from time constant. Okay, so <clears throat> here we see the system again, and uh, this is basically, I already talked about this, so I'll skip this slide, basically saying it, it's a total system contribution that you have to worry about everything, not just simply the battery string that you're working on. The reason why I bring this up is uh, a couple weeks ago, we were working with a client where uh, somebody just did a point calculation and said that their, the PPE level was effectively zero. And when the, somebody else came along and asked for us to do the calculation, we came to find out that the PPE level was dangerous. And basically with the connected configuration, the, uh, the employees in the event of an arc flash would have been killed. So uh, please keep in mind that it's a system level calculation and it's dynamic as a state of function of charge. Okay, so I talked about a couple of equations. So in the back of NFP 70E in, a, in Appendix D and also in IEEE 1584, it talks about the maximum current method for DC systems. This was developed by a gentleman by Ralph Lee back in the 50s and 60s, and it still is the gold standard today. And basically, through his analysis and through his testing, he said that the, arc, the arcing current on a DC system is 50% of the bolted fault. And the resulted incident energy is 1% uh, of the system, the voltage of the system, this is where your state of charge comes into play, times your arcing current times the time in order for it to interrupt. 
So in order to determine the instant energy, we've got to figure out what the state of charge is. We have to calculate what the, what the uh, available fault duty is. And then we've got to figure out how quickly our protective device is going to open it. So there are several calculations that go into doing this. I'm, I'm trying also to be sensitive to time because I know I'm, I'm going a little bit long, so I'm going to start speeding up a little bit. I uh, apologize for that. We'll try and capture some of this stuff in, in the Q&A towards the end. So for DC systems, I talked about how it's an exponential function. Um, we learned that current is, big, again, part of Ohm's law. We have uh, current is equal to volts divided by the resistance. This is system level. But since it's a transient and the, the energy has to be dissipated through the, the inductive circuit, it's an exponential function. And for DC systems, specifically for battery systems, it takes about five time constants, that's the, the resistance to inductive ratio, in order for it to get to about 100%. So in the event that you calculated that your system had a 100, uh, 100 milliseconds time constant, typically, in an event, in a, in a short circuit duty, it could take up to 500 milliseconds for the system to reach its maximum potential energy, and then, depending upon the performance of your, your protected device, it may or may not see that and open up in a sufficient time. So if we go back to the previous uh, slide where it showed about the overall instant energy, um, both the time for interrupting and the total, the total arcing current will impact the overall calculation. We typically have to run several scenarios as engineers to try and figure out what the bounding worst case scenario is. Um, and that will go on and talk about the protective device performance. Um, IEEE 1584 provides all sorts of uh, guidance for, for protective device uh, protection and coordination. Effectively, the important thing for engineers is we have to understand how they're going to perform. So I'm going to bring the flash, the uh, time current curve back up. And what I have here is just simply a couple of lines. The red line there kind of shows what would typically happen in a DC system in an arcing event. Uh, it's shown to be, it's supposed to be an exponential function. The the green line there is basically shows how an AC system would perform. So if you look at the time current curve, that all, it will take quite some time for the system to respond in this motor case breaker to respond to a DC event. That's really all the intent I'm trying to show here. Step five, what is the incident energy? What is the incident energy analysis and why is it important for DC systems? I alluded to this earlier, but doing the incident energy analysis basically is we're looking at the, the thermal part, the properties of the incident alone, uh, only because we're trying to map that to making sure we have the right PPE for our employees. So understanding that it's in, it's in uh, centimeters or joules per square, per square inch, we use the maximum power method that's, uh, that's alluded to until another method comes along. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, Ralph Lee did the, the calculated the, the maximum power method, and since then it's been uh, evaluated by uh, Emerin and Doan. Those are all references I could provide you if you want to do additional research on that. But ultimately, they've val independently validated Ralph Lee's uh, calculations. And since then, the, the industry has adopted that until um, either NFPA or IEEE or some other consortium come up with a, a better way of characterizing DC systems. So an event, effectively, in order to do an arc flash hazard analysis, you basically have to determine the amount of energy within the system, and you've got to figure out how quickly it's going to open up and respond to that. Now, for DC systems, um, I thought earlier come back to this, this, this equation, is that the time for the system to respond and the protective device response is the biggest variable we got to consider. Your state of charge is probably going to be known. I know we were working with another client that was talking about when they do maintenance, um, they're going to run down their their battery banks to about 25%. And I asked them if they understood what the consequences of that would be, and he, they really didn't know what the worst-case scenario was going to be for running it down to 25%. And we were able to do a calculation for them showing what the, the difference in and hazards were going to be, and they were they were shocked at how slow the protective device were going to open up and interrupt uh, a, a fault. That so ultimately, uh, as you go through and you characterize the the systems, please engage your engineers 
um, early in this process so they can help on the design side and doing the calculations throughout. So when you get to from the get into the detailed design and get into the construction, you can bound the, the hazards and so you already have it all identified. One common only overlooked uh, variable um, is that these, these calculations that are done, if they're done in a box, uh, NFPA 70E Article D5, D51 basically says you've got to take that instant energy and multiply it by three. Why do you got to multiply it by three? Because ultimately you're, uh, you're in a cone of influence and that, the instant energy is really going to go one direction and is magnified by the different walls, energy bouncing off each other, it comes screaming out at the employee. So not only do you have to do your, your calculations to determine the instant energy, you've got to multiply it by three if it's in a box, like what we saw on the vignette. Step four, this is where I typically do my risk assessment. And this is uh, identify the risks, uh, identify the tasks that are gonna be performed, um, and that includes, uh, I used to work in a radiological environment, and they're doing the safety work checks. We had to, somebody had, so had to be somebody inside the area in their radiological uh, clothing covered by the, the, the coveralls to, to recover the person in the event there's a hazard. So that's gotta be part of it as well. That doesn't, you gotta document the hazard for each risk, estimate the, the, the risks, and you gotta figure out how you're gonna mitigate it. This uh, picture here just basically shows a good example out of, uh, of NFPA 70E. If you don't have a electrical safety risk assessment form, I'd recommend that you follow that. It's uh, pretty straightforward and a good example in Appendix F of that standard. Now we need to select the PPE. Now I'm gonna go back, to this brings us back to the very first slide that you can either use a table if you know, if you know what the, the short circuit current contribution is already available or you use the instant energy analysis. So let's take a look at that table. Here's 15, here's, that's gonna be uh, C15 Bravo. But you can see here, if you're working on a DC system and you had the uh, current between seven and 15 kA, it would say go ahead and, and put on PPE uh, category three and your arc flash boundary would be about six feet. What is PPE level three? Well, the, the standard says you gotta go off and look at the next table and that'll be C16. And you would find out that, although it's, a, it's, I, it's not really readable, readable here, but it basically says you're gonna have arc ready clothing and a face shield and jackets and, and gloves on. So it has a rating of 25 calories per centimeter squared. So that's one way of determining this. And if you don't, want to, if you don't have the math, but you already know what the short circuit current is available to the DC system. Otherwise you get into doing a incident energy analysis. Um, this slide basically is to show you two examples of, of a job that was recently done. And basically it comes up using commercially available software. It says, okay, here's your hazards. Uh, let's look at this first one. We say um, 6.2 calories per centimeter squared is the calculated energy at this one site. Then what we end up doing is we go to appendix H, table H3, in order to determine what that PPE is that we'd have, to, we'd have to use. So we come here to the next slide. Here's that table we talked about. And looking at the, the incident energy at 6.2 calories, we'd find out that it'd be in the second one down there where it says 1.2 to 12, and it lists the PPE that we'd have to use. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is either use a table or you do the analysis, but you can't do both and you can't mix them because otherwise you end up putting a person in either too much PPE or not enough. Step eight, determine the appropriate working distances. Um, this is right out of a table, and, and, uh, and both in 70E and 1584. Uh, basically says if you're working on this level of gear, here's your distances, and it's typically between uh, 455 millimeters, about 18 inches, and 110 is about three feet. So then we gotta do is determine our clash boundary. This is a little bit more complicated um, because we need to figure out how far do we need to keep people away. Uh, and we do this by doing the risk assessment. We have to, we have, to have a documented plan of who can, who, who can and can't be in the, uh, the approach boundary. Um, you have, it's gotta be authorized by your management just because of the risks, which we, which we identified earlier. And you gotta have the right PPE identified. So how do we go about calculating this? We've got this fancy equation here. It basically says for uh, distances, you gotta consider all these variables of the voltage levels, the incident energy, the time for the uh, 
the protected device to interrupt it, and the distances that you're working from. You can see that <clears throat> over here, this is a, a picture from NFPA uh, 70E of a gentleman working in a motor control center with the full with the full gear on, a full space shield. Obviously, he's in a pretty significant hazard there. And you can see that there on the on the, every bucket is a arc flash sticker and hazards identify what the level that they're working on. So in a nutshell, that's how you do DC systems. The important thing is to remember is that DC systems behave completely different than AC systems and that uh, when you're characterizing them, you, you got to consider all the variables including the state of charge, uh, the protected device, the rise times, and don't, don't skimp yourself on trying to get all the impedance information in there. Insufficient impedance information can, can result in, in greater rise times. So with that, um, some of the contractor pitfalls that you run into. Limited understanding of the engineering physics behind the characterization, characterization of DC systems. We're all proud engineers, but uh, I am surprised routinely at the complications of DC transient systems and what they do to energy storage systems. Um, specifically, uh, you look at the, when you're, when you're const under construction, where there's limited amount of PPE, we're going to have to try and train your people to understand as they're building this, the, the strings get more and more dangerous, and there comes a point in time where you're going to have to don your PPE. Um, our crash risk assessments are system level analysis. Uh, don't fall victim to somebody coming up with an Excel spreadsheet and giving you a single point off of one battery string, uh, because we're required to look at the entire the entire system as a contribution. Because lock and tag incidents happen all the time, and that's why we've had so many injuries. Um, use use the incident use your analysis, do your math whenever possible. Uh, when not possible, it's okay to use the tables per the standards. Uh, you need to also understand that the contribution from the AC side to the inverter is commonly overlooked because the inverter may be installed by other people or other contractors. And the system rise time for DC systems is significantly different than AC systems. I can go into more of the physics of that, but I'm already way over my time for Q&A. So with that, are there any questions? Yes, Robert, um, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. We do have a quick question here. Um, someone wants to know, if uh, does a bounding DC AFHA cover my system if I elect not to build on that level? So as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, I'll, I'll use a specific example uh, as to illustrate this. A large energy storage system manufacturer wants to bound their system and be able to design everything from a smaller module, readily transportable system, to big, huge industrial installations. And everything is a function of the, the, the system rise time. So if you elect to build a smaller system, it could, I mean, people can say, well, it's a smaller system, it's going to have a, a, small, a shorter rise time. That's not necessarily the case. Um, my answer is that you got to do the math uh, in order to characterize it. In some cases, it, it will may result in uh, a bounding condition. It may be more safe, but it's always better to, for the engineers to quickly do the math and to come up with an answer. And also, part of that is also remember state of charge. State of charge, we did another analysis that uh, you would think logically a 25% state of charge would uh, uh, be safer uh, but in this case, with the lower voltage, it took the, it was the instant energy long, it was shorter, it took longer for the protective device to interrupt it, resulting in a greater flash. So, got to understand what, the, what we're working on. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to remind everyone very quickly that you can submit questions in the chat box in your browser. Um, looks like we have another one coming in here. Um, someone would like to know what is the accident or incident rate? for arc flash events in DC battery systems? Chris, that's a very good, very good question. Um, unfortunately, the, the, this is a, DC systems are becoming um, newer all the time. And we have to wait for the statistics to come in. 
Uh, so I don't have any definitive answers to say, yeah, it's this, but it is happening. Uh, and as employers, we need to make sure that we characterize the, the situation properly so they know to keep that from happening. I would like to say that there's none, um, but we're, we're getting only, I get their information from Bureau of Labor and, 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 and Statistics, so I'm kind of relying upon them. And ultimately, it's up to the employer to report on their FARs. Hopefully that answers your question, Chris. Thank you. Uh, we have another question um, from Jason. Uh, Jason would like to know, what ranges of battery resistance have you seen for 1,000 um, VDC uh, lithium ion technologies? So, so uh, typically the ones the analysis that we're looking at, they're nominally about, I'm going to say nominally, right, because I, I don't want to divulge any proprietary information. I've seen them around 25 to 40 milliohms as a as, as a starting point. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Um, how do you characterize DC fault contribution for a fault on the AC end or worse, a fault inside the inverter past the IGBTs? Um, do you automatically assume 150% of the inverter FLA? Great question, bro. Oh, great, great question. Um, the the answer is basically you have to understand the type of inverter that's there. I alluded to earlier, if it's self commutating, uh, I've written all sorts of white papers on on inverter contribution for both AC and DC sides. We'll talk primarily on the, the AC to DC at this point. Um, if there's a fault within the inverter itself and self commentating it's self extinguishing and typically you only have to worry about the contribution from the deep, from the batteries coming in and typically those will let go before it gets too large IGBTs are not relied upon for for uh, inter although we kind of rely upon them to interrupt faults they're not a protective device so uh, really can't answer that question because I don't have any definitive answer but I can I can send you a white paper that I've written on what, how to properly characterize the inverter contribution. Now, on the AC side, it's a different story. Um, we've seen that there is a, a noticeable contribution on the AC side, assuming that's uh, near field fault to the to the inverter. Uh, but of course, further into the system, depending upon where it is, uh, that becomes less and less uh, noticeable. But uh, the, there, you, you have to characterize the entire system, both AC and DC, in order to determine the hazards that are there. So to answer your question, you, you got to do both. Great, thank you. Um, another question here: Are inverters typically used today in battery systems self-commutating or line commutating? I can only speak from my experience um, in that the battery systems we're using that typically I've seen more I've seen mostly self commutating inverters, but there have been a couple of instances and like there's one we're working on right now that is not. And we have to try and figure out what is the overall contribution to the inverter for that. Great, Great question. Uh, Great questions coming in. Um, keep it up. So um, just want to remind everyone again that uh, if you can submit questions in the chat box. Um, I see one or two more here that we have. Um, so we're uh, nearing the end of the question. So if you have something to submit, please let us know. Um, I have another question here. When you say a system level calculation, what is involved in characterizing that system? Uh, okay, so fantastic question. Um, if we're assuming, okay, I'm going to talk specifically for an example of the system that I'm working on right now. It's a, it's a large industrial DC energy storage system, batteries. <clears throat> we have to get everything from the, as I showed on one of the, the slides, we have to characterize the battery modules. We have to understand the overall cable size and length. We get into the protective devices. We could even get into, in some cases, if they're long runs, uh, even down to the type of cabling they're using, if they're using bus work. Uh, effectively, what you're, you're, you're after is to, do, to, to identify and characterize anything that could add to the overall impedance of the system that will impact your rise time. 
So it's inverters, it's wires, it's it's the batteries. It's the, if you end up having uh, uh, panels with fuses or breakers, you have to get all that information characterized as well. And it has basically had to turn that into a mathematical formula in order to uh, characterize what the overall system rise time is going to be. Also, um, also, don't want to forget state of charge. <laughs> but I hit somebody to pound the desk on that one. State of charge is, is crucial uh, because we need to figure out, keep that in there as well, because it will impact the overall, proportionally, what the overall instant energy is going to be for the system. So everything. It's like if I go back to that one drawing, if I end up having a, a if you end up having, for sake of discussion, uh, 12 strings of batteries connected to an inverter, everything from the primary side contribution to, to let through the type of inverter the protective gear, the cables, the batteries, everything that would be in there could be used to either interrupt or contribute to system rise time. Um, great, thank you. Um, did, did you just answer the question, second question from Chris about what is the typical rise time and how does it vary between large and small kilowatt systems? Yeah, okay, so um, typical rise times. So you can see on, on smaller systems, of course, you're going to see faster rise times intuitively, right? So you might see uh, overall system impedance ratio of inductance to, to resistance gets you in a 20, 20 millisecond range. Um, the important thing to remember, though, is regardless of what the overall rise time is, it's important to remember that it's going to, it's going to take on order about five uh, five time constants in order for it to get to its maximum level before the protective device even starts seeing that. So if you do the math and it's a low level, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a small uh, rise time, um, just simply multiply that by five and, and look at your time current curve and see how long it's going to take to interrupt that, that apparatus. And uh, in the absence of specific information, I would always take a worst case scenario and uh, the IEEE and, and the NFPA 70E is that no employee will stand in, in the presence of an arc flash greater than two seconds. So if you find out your rise time is greater than two seconds, as you're both doing your math, uh, you bound it by two seconds. So uh, I know that's not really the answer to the question, but th they really vary depending upon the complexity and the design of the system. Wow, great. Thank you. Um, as before we get to the end of our time, I'd just like to make a couple quick announcements before we go. Um, first, I just would like to remind everyone, if you are an ESA member, please go to energystorage.org slash members to let us know of any updates, like a change of address or any new employees. Um, I'd also like to invite everyone uh, who is interested in energy storage policy information to attend the 2018 Energy Storage Policy Forum that will be held on February 14th in Washington, D.C. Um, this is the same week as the Nehru Winter Meeting, so if you plan to be here for that, you can just go ahead and add us to your list of things to do. Also, um, again, I'd like to invite everyone to save the date for our annual conference, uh, which will be held in Boston this April, and today is actually the last day to receive early bird savings, so Go to energystorage.org slash ready for business to find out more and um, register. And uh, seeing no further questions, and actually at the end of our time, I just want to uh, give a very warm thank you to our speaker today, Robert and Brad uh, with Intertech, for the insightful presentation. And um, thank you so much, guys. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. And thank if you, you have any Great questions, questions, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Mm -hmm.